And welcome to another episode of the Pixel Drone Show, the show where we talk to industry professionals about how they use their drones. I'm really excited today because we have actually a follow-up interview. Uh, I had talked to uh, Trevor Woods' uh, predecessor at the uh, Northern Plains UAS test site, and uh, that was actually before Pixel was in existence, the Pixel Drone Show. And I'm really excited that Trevor is here today because uh, they've been doing quite a few things at the test site, and he's going to give us an update on uh, everything that is going on. So. Uh, my co-host today is Haya Kestalu from Drone Excel, and we're really excited to have you on the show talking to us about drones and how you are integrating them into the airspace of North Dakota. I know you're talking about BV loss flights and a lot of things that have been very hot uh, in the news in the last couple of uh, weeks. So, uh, Trevor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate you uh, allowing me to be here. So Nick, uh, not Nick, I'm sorry, I keep saying Nick. Nick was the previous uh, person, uh, Nick Flum. And uh, so Trevor, you are a, a UND grad and um, you have actually a long history with the test side. You were the director of operation, you were the director of safety, and then now you're the uh, executive director. Uh, tell us how you get involved in with drones. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so my I, I get to be uh, one of two employees that gets to say that I was an employee of the test site before the test site existed. And uh, what that means is, you know, when I got into the aviation business, um, you know, back in 2008, 2009, of course, was uh, uh, the Great Recession was going on. There wasn't a lot of uh, activity in terms of hiring pilots and, and upward uh, movement in the industry with the airlines. And you know, here I was uh, a flight instructor at the University of North Dakota, and I've always known that I did not want to be a commercial airline pilot for my entire career. Uh, I kind of assumed I'd have to do something like that for a while until I found, you know, what do I really want to do? But given there was a lot of constraints in hiring and everything going on, uh, an opportunity was opened up in the University of North Dakota. They were doing a lot of UAS research, and so I just started to show up. And, uh, you know, I started to show up. I had a man pilot background and one of the gaps that team had at the time was having somebody with actual operational experience of, of flying in the airspace and then taking that information and transferring it into, you know, the drone space and helping build operations and helping build safety cases at that time. And so I just started to show up and, you know, one thing led to another. Pretty soon I'm an hourly employee and then I've started to get exposed to other opportunities with the local sheriff's office and other research projects. And before you know it, there's a, uh, an open, you know, full-time position that I get to apply for uh, to the predecessor of the test site, which was the uh, Center of Excellence in U.S. Research Education and Training. And one of my very first tasks uh, that my uh, supervisor gave me at the time was, hey, we are going to have you help support this proposal to become a national test site in North Dakota. And I said, that sounds great. What does that mean? And he's like, I don't know, but it seems like a good idea. So we're going to go for it. <laughs> and so I got to be part of this large team in North Dakota that helped write this proposal to uh, explain why North Dakota should be you know, a, a primary site for testing of, of drones and, and UAS activity. And uh, you know, eventually it gets into legislation and eventually there's a, a competition for it and then we win. And so, you know, the day they say, hey, North Dakota, you've been selected, they hire a the very first executive director, which was Bob Beckland. He shows up, he goes into the office and I show up and say, hey, I'm your operations guy. I've also been uh, the one that has been obtaining all of the regulatory approvals with the Federal Aviation Administration for the university at that time. And he said, that sounds great. You're working for me now. And there we go. So I started working for the test site since, you know, day one. And, um, you know, at, at some point in the, a, a position was opened for the director of operations, I applied and then Bob Beckland left because he was part of the uh, Air National Guard and he was promoted to be a general and had to be put on a different assignment. And then um, Nicholas Flom at that time then moved into the executive director role. And then I took uh, the role of director of safety under Nick for the last five years up until um, last October. Awesome. awesome. That's uh, it. Sounds really good. Um, for our audience, can can you give us an idea of what happens on a day to day basis at the uh, Northern Plain UAS uh, site? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, to, to be perfectly honest, the day to day is usually different every single day. Um, and that's probably what makes this uh, uh, a fun and exciting uh, place to work, in my opinion. Um, you know, we have all sorts of clients that we support, whether it be federal government clients that, you know, like the, the Federal Aviation Administration or NASA um, or even Department of Defense. They all are in UAS research uh, spaces and they like to work with the test site program to accomplish their goals and objectives. Um, we also have uh, industry clients that come to us that, that partner with us to try to solve some of the core challenges of integrating drones into the airspace. So that could be, you know, somebody has a, uh, a detect and avoid system or they are working on certification of their unmanned aircraft. They may leverage uh, our expertise and our relationship with the FAA to help make that happen. Uh, and then more significantly, uh, the Vantis program, which is the uh, statewide network initiative that North Dakota has taken on to help uh, enable beyond visual line of sight activity in North Dakota. And be because of the changes in projects and because of the changes in weather, and you know, that's where I mean the day-to-day -day is, is never the same. Um, right now we're coming into the spring and so the weather's improving and so there's probably a lot more preparation activity going on, getting ready for, uh, you know, the summer season of flying and when we are flying, it's usually longer days. You're usually deploying people out into different parts of North Dakota as well as the rest of the United States, depending on where our partners needs are. And, and so that's going on all, you know, all summer, all fall until the weather turns. And then, you know, it goes back into winter and in winter doesn't mean it becomes slow. It just means that now our, our energy is diverted inside the organization internally. You know, we might be assessing um, our processes, our procedures, our, you know, lessons learned from the last flying season. So, yeah, every single day, it's a little bit different. Yeah. So um, the um, can you tell us the, the, the history of the test site. I know you guys were part of the UPP program. I know the FA now has this Beyond thing. Are you also part of Beyond as well? And can you maybe talk about what these programs are for our listeners that may not be familiar with them? Yeah, sure thing. So yeah, we, we are part of the B Beyond program with the FAA and the predecessor to Beyond was the Integration Pilot Program or commonly called the IPP. Um, I, this was actually a program near and dear to my heart. It was something that I championed inside the organization and for North Dakota for many years, as well as uh, some of my counterparts in the North Dakota Department of Transportation, uh, as they are the lead agency on this for North Dakota, but, but we hold a lot of the, the expertise and, and experience here. So we've supported that. Um, the integration pilot program started uh, back in 2017 as an initiative from the executive branch of the federal government that basically said, hey, look, there are three core challenges that, that you know, industry is looking to solve, and it is uh, night operations of using drones during, the, during night, uh, operations over human beings, and beyond visual line of sight. And so there was a competition to become you know, a, uh, an IPP lead that the FAA would select and partner with. And what that really means is, you know, at the end of the day, this industry really wants to expand and advance UAS operations. This industry is quite large. There's lots of different companies, lots of different players, uh, lots of different interests out there, but the FAA only has so much resources to go around. And so really, in, in my opinion, these are programs that help the FAA streamline, you know, who do we work with on a more routine basis to help solve these challenges? And so we put a team together that we felt had the pedigree and history on showing how we are able to tackle these advanced UAS operations. And we were selected of one of 10. And, uh, you know, we really uh, took hold on working some of the flight over people uh, regulatory challenges at that time. And so it was really fun because then we were able to get approval to fly, you know, two small unmanned aircraft over a tailgating crowd at the Fargo Dome in, in, in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, the significance of that is they have the North Dakota State University Bison uh, football team, and they are known for their tailgating events. And so we were able to get approval to fly over everybody and, and get some, you know, aerial video of the tailgating uh, activities that were going on at the time. 
Uh, of course, you invite the FAA out, you show what this can do. Um, but, it, you know, there's, it's not just being able to fly over people. It was also the security side of it. You usually want to have, you know, law enforcement maintain and make sure nothing bad's happening. And so you kind of get things like that uh, with, with public safety, um, as well as, you know, everyone likes that aerial shot of just seeing everybody there excited for the football game. And I believe they won. So that was, you know, that was a good yeah. thing. Um, and so we took that initiative and really then figured out how to scale that, you know, that was really cool. But now how do you do that in the rest of the United States? So we championed a lot of uh, the regulatory work for opening the door to parachute operations at that time. And then once we kind of cracked that nut, we just kept submitting, you know, requests into the FAA as quickly as we could to try to get approval. And pretty soon, you know, not, not long thereafter, many people in the industry could buy a parachute for their Phantom 4 or for their Mavic and, uh, you know, request a waiver from the FAA, and they were basically being uh, granted approval almost immediately. And then that eventually led to the uh, uh, flight over people rules that were developed and, and released later down the line. And so that's just our specific part of the IPP. But, you know, there was 10 lead participants uh, on the IPP, um, others that focused more on the impact energy of, of flight over people, uh, others that focused more on the beyond visual line of sight, uh, airworthiness certification and part 135 operations. And, and so that all of that collective knowledge as the program came to an end, the FAA did not want to abandon and industry did not want to abandon that collaborative relationship with the FAA. And so the FAA has proposed uh, continuing the program under a different name called Beyond. And at that point in time, flight during night and flight over people were essentially solved. We've got rules and regulations for that but beyond visual line of sight continues to be a, cha a challenge. So let's continue to do this program, we'll call it beyond, and it's going to be focused solely on the beyond visual line of sight component of drones. Parallel to all of that activity, North Dakota recognized the opportunity to tackle this challenge of beyond visual line of sight. It's you know, the elusive dream for everybody operating in this space, especially for industry. And at the end of the day, like, if you have the ability to see and avoid traffic in the national airspace system, and you have the ability to control your airplane, you know, while, while flying, um, then, you know, you, you have your solution at, at a very simple level. The hard part is like actually deploying technology and proving it's safe, right? So we were able to successfully convince the leaders in our state that like, hey, look, as a test site, as IPP, of all these programs we've been part of, we actually think we can do this. And it's gonna take a little bit of investment, but this is something that's difficult for industry to do on their own. Because if you wanna enable linear infrastructure inspection, you know, you have your, your, your distribution and, and transmission line inspection uh, power utilities, you know, like your XL energies, um, you have your oil and gas uh, pipeline type infrastructure. You have your roadway infrastructure with like departments of transportation. You have your rail infrastructure like BNSF. And the thing is like BNSF has been tackling this for years, but they're doing it mostly from their own investment to solve their own challenges. We saw that, okay, rail, pipeline, transmission lines, they all kind of fall in the same corridor. So why would you not treat this like kind of like transportation infrastructure where you know, the government can help offset some of the cost and you can recover that through taxes and registrations and fees and other things like that. But if we invest in this infrastructure once and open it up to yeah. all industry, there's an incredible cost savings associated with that. So we were working on that. The Beyond program comes out and says, hey, we wanna focus on BV loss. And to get to BV loss, you have to create performance requirements. You have to test against those performance requirements. You have to do this for aerial surveillance. You have to do this for command and control. If you do that, we think you can get to BB loss in a scalable, repeatable way. And we're like, hey, we think the same thing. So we move into the Beyond program with the FAA and have been focusing exclusively exclusively on the deployment of this statewide network that we call Vantis. And uh, I think we have been making a lot of progress by having the FAA uh, be part of that. And uh, I'm really excited to see where we go. Uh, we're kind of on the we're gonna be entering into another flying season here where we have already deployed some of that infrastructure out in the Western side of North Dakota. We have already started to flight test with both, both unmanned and manned aircraft um, to 
validate that the, the the radars that are watching for airplanes so that we we can avoid each other and the communication radios that are talking to each other uh, are all working at a level that is considered safe and we have all the data to show that we have our request in with the federal aviation administration to um, evaluate that data and and start to open the door on actual beyond visual line of sight operations using this infrastructure so that was a really long answer but hopefully <laughs> Hopefully that tells the. the <laughs> it's impressive. A very, a very long, but a very detailed and informative answer. I mean, it it kind of shows us why these UAS uh, test sites are so important in helping to develop the, uh, the regulations that we all fly within. Um, for the people that are listening to our show and for the people that have never been to a UAS test site, can you describe for us what it looks like both on the ground as well as in the air? Oh yeah, it's a it's a very common question and. Uh, and I'll tell you what's unique, at least about North Dakota, and I can't speak about all the other test sites, uh, uh, but North Dakota, the test site ends up being anywhere and everywhere. Um, we structured ourselves so that we were not geographically bound to a very specific spot on the earth. We recognized very early on that in order for our services and our, our concepts to be valuable, we would have to have the flexibility to deploy equipment wherever the use case needed us, you know, the use case, whether it be package delivery mm -hmm. or linear infrastructure inspection or whatever. And so we've always been structured to be very nimble and mobile. And that has allowed us to operate both within North Dakota, as well as in many other states in the United States. And, and so when somebody says, hey, can I come see the test site? It's, it's uh, well, you know, where do you want to go? <laughs> That's where we can go fly. Um, and we've been able to mature our processes with the Federal Aviation Administration where obtaining the regulatory approvals for flight, um, you know, we're, we're, we're highly confident in our ability to get that. We've got a really great relationship with our mm -hmm. partners at the federal level. So when, when we are partnering with some of these federal agencies or other uh, 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 agencies that are looking to start to test and validate their systems, we can easily get those approvals. And, and go fly in the environment that the drone is wanting to fly in. You know, like, hey, I really wanna build this drone for package delivery. Great, we can actually go into an environment, a test environment that is very um, uh, applicable to that, that package delivery environment and start to validate your information and validate your drone and your systems uh, for that use case. And so that becomes really valuable. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that is the test site. So when somebody comes and visits us, um, at the end of the day, it ends up just being offices. Uh, we do have some cool laboratories, you know, with like 3D printers and some of our airplanes, yeah. and we have a deployment trailer. You know, that's the, the real fun stuff to see. Um, more recently, uh, we have this uh, Mission and Network Operations Center, or what we call the MNOC. Um, that is permanent infrastructure that has been installed, uh, and, it, and it, uh, it started in 2021. It is almost finished. We have uh, what I call the polish left, you know, put put the blinds on the windows kind of thing. Um, but this this facility is an operations center that is monitoring the infrastructure and the operations that that are tied in with us. And so, you know, we've been operating for nine years now, uh, being very mobile, mobile and nimble, and just finally got to a point where it was necessary to have permanent infrastructure. And that permanent infrastructure is there to actually continue to enable you know, that mobile flexible uh, uh, type of operation because the pilots and crew can, continue, can still continue to go into the field, but you have this operation center that's monitoring the integrity and the safety of the systems and can alert the pilot and crew if something is not performing as it should be. Yeah, so I think uh, I live in the state of New York and upstate New York in Rome. Uh, there is also a UES uh, test site and I think it's based on a, I believe an old, uh, airport that was used in in, in the uh, second world war um they've had they have like this airspace reserved for their testing but it sounds like your setup is a lot more nimble and mobile as you said can you tell us a little bit about how many uas test sites there are in the us and how many are set up mm -hmm. like yours or is yours very different from uh, from the other ones yeah that's a, a great question uh, initially there were uh, six test sites uh, that were named in the original faa designation and then a couple of years later, uh, a seventh test site was added based on the legacy uh, work that was being done with the FAA at that time. And so there's seven test sites. We are all geographically dispersed. As you've indicated, you know, New York is, is one of them. Um, Virginia is another one. Texas, New Mexico, Nevada, uh, Alaska, and then, of course, North Dakota. 
And so each one of these test sites has their unique attributes, their unique geography. And that's in fact what the FAA wanted. You know, there was, it was not gonna be valuable to have one test center or one test site or multiple test sites all in the same kind of environmental condition, whether that be the air or the ground site or some combination thereof. And um, based on how the program was set up uh, in its history, it also had to be tied to a public entity. And so a lot of these test sites will have an association with uh, like a major research university. Um, a lot of them are tied in with their state government um, and, and we're no different in that regard. You know, we have an authority board that is uh, represented by many of the state agencies in North Dakota who have a, a vested interest in, in drones and automation and UAS. Um, and we are housed within one of the research universities to essentially do our day-to-day -day operations. Um, but, but our mission is to execute the UAS strategy for North Dakota and to help the FAA integrate drones into the airspace. And so I, I, I do believe that every test site is a little bit unique in how they operate and what their, their structure is and what their advantages are. Um, you know, Alaska has a unique advantage of, of their particular climate and weather and their use cases that uh, may make sense for, for some in the industry, but it may not make sense for others. And so I think there's a, a, a shared collaboration there with industry where, you know, hey, look, if, if um, you know, somebody comes to North Dakota, but we're, we're probably just not at the right environment, they're really interested in that hot, you know, environment that's uh, more readily available, you know, perhaps they're going to go to Nevada or Texas, and that's going to better suit their needs and, and work with them. So, you know, I, I, uh, I think that's the best way to characterize it. Uh, I'm, I'm cautious to, to represent the other test sites and what they do because I think they're a better fit to describe, you know, their particular advantages. But, um, but yeah, I think we, we just have a, a shared collaboration that uh, you have the ability if you're in industry or the government to uh, figure out which one's going to best suit your needs and, and work with them. Um, I, I was wondering, how is it set up? I mean, does every test site report their, their findings and their best practices back to the FEA and the FEA then orchestrates it from there? Or do you guys collaborate among each other and then share best practices as well? That's a great question. A little bit of both. Um, as being part of a test site, we do have a, an agreement with the FAA that we are going to share and collaborate on, uh, on data, flight data. Uh, this data is not uh, competition sensitive data. You know, it's like how many flights are you doing? How high, how long, how far, um, what kind of equipment? Um, and so we provide a lot of that back to the FAA on a very routine basis. We have mandatory reporting requirements for like quarterly reports or annual reports that kind of collect, you know, all the activity uh, over periods of time, provides lessons learned. Um, and then uh, we, uh, as a as a community with the FAA, we also have routine uh, meetings and teleconferences where we get together, kind of just talk about the latest happenings, the latest issues, the latest challenges, and that is our opportunity to uh, share lessons learned and talk about that, and more importantly, identify opportunities that we can collaborate on that help influence and move things in in a forward direction for the industry. Um, and then the last part of that is. We also hold routine technical interchange meetings, and these have traditionally been held face to face. Um, more recently, of course, they've been virtual, uh, but that's where I'd say we invest the most amount of time in connecting up with each other and really diving deeper into some core topics and core challenges. And then the FAA will bring in the right resources on their side. You know, if um, if the latest and greatest issue is certification, for example, they might bring in the right people from the certification offices of the FAA to help uh, work through and identify a plan on, on how to move that forward. I, I want to, and this is really cool. And, and later on, I think we're going to talk about your relationship with the FAA and kind of how you, you guys work with them and, and how the FAA is involved. Um, I want to talk about the BV loss thing because it's kind of a hot topic that we've been hearing quite a bit, especially with the ARC report that came out a couple of days ago. And I have some questions on that that I want to ask. But um, I've heard you mention a, a network several times in the conversation already. Um, why is a network necessary to do beyond visual line of sight? And I'm sure this is a question that you get all the time. I kind of know the answer, but I know a lot of people ask us the same question. So I'm going to ask it for you and you can explain it. Uh, why, why is 5G not good enough at this stage to do what we want to do for BV loss? And, uh, and how is that network? What does that network look like in terms of infrastructure on the ground and what you guys have been building? That's a great question. Uh, 
I like to use analogies a lot if I can. And asking the cellular network to enable, you know, drone operations is a lot like asking the roadways to allow a train to, to run on it. You know, it was never designed for that purpose, but the concept is the same, right? And so that's where people start to make that connection. And, and I resonate with that. Um, but, you know, there, there's multiple questions there. You know, the first is let's talk about the network side. Uh, you know, we, we've realized that drones can operate much like your cell phone, right? As, as it flies through the airspace system, um, it can connect from tower to tower to maintain that, that communication channel wherever that pilot happens to be located, you know, because it's a remote pilot that might be located in the area or not even in the area can connect into this network. And then the network is connected to all the tower sites that have the radio on board that allow that continuity to occur. And then, of course, the MNOC is monitoring the performance of that network at all times to make sure it's it's performing at a safe level uh, necessary for aviation. Um, and so, you know, why can't or shouldn't 5G be part of that? Uh, I, I go back to that analogy I said before with the roadways. You know, 5G in, in, in cellular technology prior is been designed and certified in the standards built upon the use of a consumer cellular device, as well as uh, communication devices for like, um, you know, public emergency or public safety. And so that's what those networks were designed to do. Could they be part of the solution? I think absolutely. Um, but I don't think we can go out and say that it's a, an end all solution for everything. Right. So there might be some elements that it works. It makes sense. But again, the network was really never designed uh, with drones in mind. And so it may work, but it's not going to be the best solution. It's not going to be the most efficient solution. You know, can I put the train yep. on the asphalt and drive along the road? Probably don't want to do that. It's, it's you know, the concept's the same, but it's it's just, it's not it's not set up for that. So, um, and, and, you know, with how radio waves propagate in the airspace, you know, your cell phone, you're typically towards the ground. So the radios are set to be communicating towards the ground where a drone is meant to be airborne and flying long distances and far distances. And so you, you have to calibrate the radios accordingly for that. Um, so yeah, that's, um, you know, that's kind of the comparison to the network there. And, and yeah, the importance of the network is that, you know, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily need a network, you know, if I have an ability to see and avoid traffic in the airspace and I have an ability to maintain communication with my airplane, but do so in a way that, meets a level of aviation safety. And what I mean by that is it doesn't have to be the same level as let's say a manned airplane, you know, manned airplanes that are certified with hundreds of people on board. But I do need to make sure that, you know, my radio doesn't have a five second latency associated with it. Because if I'm flying along and, you know, one of those manned airplanes come up from the ground and they have absolutely every right to do that based on where they're located, I have to be able to see that airplane and maneuver my drone to avoid uh, any sort of conflict. And they have the same shared responsibility, by the way. They have to be looking for traffic and also maneuver to avoid. Uh, and so if you have latency issues or if you have uh, uh, an inability to see traffic, well, that degrades safety. And that's, you know, that's not a good thing. And, and so we always prioritize safety. That's why it's important that we have a dedicated network that has the right controls on it to show that it is meeting the right performance standards to accomplish the beyond visual line of sight that uh, I'm gonna say industry really wants to see because there is probably a difference between what industry wants to see versus let's say your your average user who may be interested in only going you know three to five miles that might look a little different than somebody that's going 50 miles beyond visual line of sight. I love yep. I love how you uh, explain it in such great detail. I think a lot of uh, drone pilots might be impatient and, and they want to be able to move on to the next technology or use drones in new ways. And I know a lot of the drone startup companies have uh, have similar ambitions. But listening to you talk, it, it, you start to understand that things are a lot more complicated and it's not always uh, that easy to move things along quickly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what are the biggest challenges in terms of establishing a BVS, uh, BVLOS network, uh, or even just the regulations required to uh, to fly safely uh, beyond visual line of sight? Yeah, um, lots of uh, a lot of challenges that are intertwined with each other. You know, just because we establish a network and we have the right equipment to watch for traffic and the right equipment to control our own airplane. Um, there is a lot of pieces of this that are still missing. 
um, you know, we inter interact quite a bit with those those drone companies that that you mentioned, and uh, very incredible, innovative technology, great ways of uh, uh, doing things that we've never been able to do before, and innovative ways of, of integrating with business and industry, and and also. Uh, you know, changing the world for people and how they obtain their their, their services and, and and how they conduct business. I think it's very revolutionary and and we want to find ways and that's what our job is, is to help continue to advance that forward. Um, but the challenge is, is that the the current system, the national airspace system, the, the system that, you know, I can go board a Delta or a United flight and go fly anywhere in the world, it is the safest and most complex system that, that we've created. And it's had over a hundred years to really build that legacy. And that hundred years didn't come without its own challenges, right? And yeah. so when you look at that, you, you look at the, the pilots, the crew members, the, the flight attendants, the, the airports, all of that people power that allows that to happen has had to evolve at the same time that the airplanes have had to evolve, you know, from from the right flyer to what we have today, where you can go board and you know the the one thing you're you're most concerned about is the the interruptions while you're watching your movie on board the plane, right? I mean, like, you know, the the, the fact that we've been able to get to that point has taken over a hundred years, and I think we sometimes lose sight of that. That now we've got this brand new innovative way of of flying an air vehicle in the airspace. And we start to get really frustrated and, and it's like, well, you know, when when this industry has grown up like this and we're still down here, we just have a lot of catching up to do. And it's really easy and uh, quick to say, hey, look, it's your fault. You have to accommodate us. But, you know, the reality is we want to maintain that same level of safety in the traditional way of doing things. And we want to allow this innovative approaches to also continue to grow and develop. And that's where, you know, that's where we come in. And so. Why I'm telling you all this background is because we have to find a way to go through that same learning curve in the drone space that we've been able to do over 100 years in the manned aircraft space. Obviously, we don't want to wait 100 years. So we have to continue to tackle uh, certification challenges with the drone. You know, there has to be a way of validating that it is safe for flight. And it's really easy to say, well, I built it. I know it's safe. When you start to stress test these things over hundreds or thousands of hours, um, you know, will the equipment stand up to that kind of um, rigor or, or testing? Sometimes it won't, um, and sometimes it will. And you'd also make an argument that I don't, it doesn't need to do that. I might only be flying a couple miles in a rural area to deliver something and it becomes disposable. Okay, but there still has to be a standard of which needs to be met in order to ensure the public stays safe and, and, and they expect that anything flying in the airspace above their heads is, is flying safely. So there's that element of it. There's the pilot training and qualifications. You know, that's another um, uh, area that will continue to grow and mature. You know, these are aviators just like manned aviators, but again, different history, different legacy. I look at a lot of it like uh, um, you have fixed wing pilots and you have helicopter pilots. Both are incredibly skilled, professional people but the machines of which they operate in the air are different and they operate very differently. And the use cases that they operate those things for are different. Drones are in that same league. It's different, the use cases are different, the rigor is different, but at the end of the day, they are still aviators. And so we have a lot of growth to do uh, and mature, maturity we have to do there. And that doesn't mean that what we're doing today is, is bad or a failure. It just means that you know, it's 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 much like comparing a toddler to you know an adult. Uh, we we have to continue to grow and evolve and 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 learn some of these lessons and get them documented and get them scaled out and, and get them adopted into the industry. And we just have to allow ourselves the time to do that. Yeah, I I uh, I hear this a lot, obviously from our students and from watching people online being uh, frustrated that we can't move fast enough forward with this technology and also that it's extremely restrictive at the moment and i always like to tell them you know the the way the man aviation world became to be we started with something that was very simple and then we added complexity and then now we have that complexity and we can apply it to the uas world and then go backwards and make it you know simpler as we go as we learn more about drones but i don't think people understand that portion of it that the fa is really all about safety and they want to make sure that it's safe but anyway uh, uh the the goal for you guys right now is to go 
uh, statewide and then eventually nationwide, I'm assuming, uh, how far into the statewide implementation are you at, the, at this stage? Great question. Uh, we did an initial deployment out on the western side of North Dakota, uh, specifically around the cities of Watford City and Williston. Uh, and we did that because you can't go from nothing to statewide overnight. You know, this is real infrastructure with real cost and, and real uh, safety of flight that, that has to be validated. And so we have taken a, um, a, a, cautionary, a cautionary approach where we, you know, deploy something, test it, validate it, build the process to go with it, and now start to replicate that. So let me talk a little bit about what that means. You know, our, our team, you know, we partnered with uh, Talus USA, and they are our, what we call system integrator or system engineer. And the, the, the architecture of this network is designed as such that it's not going to be locked into a specific technology. It's not being locked into like one particular drone or one particular radio. Uh, what really matters at the end of the day is how all this technology works together. So think about your roadway again. The roadway isn't being built solely for a Honda or a Toyota or a Ford or a Dodge. It is being built to accommodate all those various vehicles, but also accommodate everything from, uh, uh, you know, uh, an 18 wheeler down to your personal car, as well as motorcycles. And so you have to think about this network in the same way that, OK, so what really matters at the end of the day is I have an ability to see and avoid airplanes. I have an ability to, con to, to control my airplane through a radio link. I have the ability to connect this stuff together so that it can be monitored in real time so that a pilot can see this information and be able to react to it. OK, so now what does that mean? I have to have a mechanism to connect to this network. I have to have a mechanism to validate that my control station that is operating the drone is also being able to connect to the network and that I have an ability to transfer control. You know, maybe I'm directly connecting and controlling my airplane and now I'm going to con connect to the network and let the network control my airplane. And all that's happening is rerouting my, my signal and where that, where that runs through. Um, and so when you think about the complexity of that, you have to build a process for each one of those. And as you know, like you do it once, like it's probably going to be good. You do it again, it gets better. You do it again. Oh, I learned something. I want to change it. I'm going to do it even better yet. I like, again, I'll, I'll go back to an analogy. If I've never done a cross country road trip, I might spend some time brainstorming and kind of building the checklist of everything that I need to do. Then I go do that once. And I go back and I think about, okay, what could I have done better? What would my checklist look like? What would my process look like? And so that's the methodical approach we are taking to this network. We did, we started that last year out in the Western side of North Dakota. Um, we're using this time to plan for 2022, where we will um, continue to mature that deployment as well as break ground on the eastern side of North Dakota, where we expect to start to deploy the next round of this infrastructure. Um, you, you talked about, you know, when does this go statewide? When does this go nationwide? Uh, the, you know, it, it, it takes resources to fund this infrastructure. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, you know, everyone's resource constrained. And so how we're building this, some of the, you know, some of that capital is coming from the state of North Dakota, but there will also be an ability to leverage um, resources if they become available from the federal level or from, you know, other opportunities. And, you know, maybe I'm just, and you use this as an example, but maybe like the oil and gas sector gets really excited about this and they want to deploy this technology in, an, you know, somewhere in the U.S. How this is being built, we can deploy where that use case happens to be. You know, you deploy the surveillance system, the communication system, you follow the same process that you did to validate that system. And now it's online to be able to go fly. And, you know, the one missing component of that is the aircraft. I've got to have an aircraft that's also compatible with talking to this network. And that's also going to be the big focus of 2022 is um, we're partnering with some OEMs that have uh, a pedigree and a history that shows that they have a high probability of getting to some level of certification with the Federal Aviation Administration. We want to help them do that uh, because without that, this, this isn't valuable. You know, you need to have your, your Fords and your Toyotas and your Dodges that are available mm -hmm. to the end users. And, and so we want to make that be available by partnering with those that are, that are in that space. So the two key players are Fantas and Thales. Uh, do, they, do they offer the, the same services or the same thing at all or no? So Vantis is kind of the, let's call it the brand name. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the iPhone to Apple. Okay, so 
Vantis is the network. That's just the brand name of it. And the Northern Plains UAS test site is, you know, the company or the organization that oversees and administrates the program. Talus is the partner, the, the, the big industry partner here that we call a system integrator that is working with all of industry, you know, OEMs, radar manufacturers, communication, um, radios, networks, uh, all of that infrastructure that is needed to make this work together. That's what Talus is really helping us with. They know how to integrate all this technology, do it in a safe way. They already operate, you know, over 60% of the aviation infrastructure worldwide. So they're a very natural fit to doing something like this. And, you know, the state side's coming in to say, hey, this is the vision, this is the architecture, this is how this needs to work. And so we formed a partnership to make that happen. And, and that partnership and, and, and what comes of this, uh, that network, the operations, the process, the procedure, the safety, all gets kind of thrown under that brand name that we call Vantis. All right. And, and, and Ventus recently had an RFP asking for uh, drone operators or not drone operators, maybe more U.S. vendors to join hands so that you can do some testing. Can, can you talk about this and what the goal is with this RFP? Great question. Uh, yeah, so we have a drone operator that uh, has already been uh, a partner with ourselves in Talus uh, during 2021, and uh, that company is uh, UAvionics. And that would, I would call that like your test bed platform. Uh, not, you know, not that that's what UAvionics is wholly, but, but they partnered with us to bring a platform where we could really, you know, uh, test out all of this stuff while it's in concept and development mode. Well, the, the technology and the processes and the integration have come to a point where we need to start to bring on additional airplanes to start going through the same process. If I have an airplane, a drone, you know, I have to integrate a radio on it. I have to integrate the ground control station software into this network so that they can talk to each other. I have to have a display so that a pilot and a crew member with the pilot can see what the airspace looks like so that they can avoid and maneuver the airplane to avoid traffic. Um, all of that takes time and energy to go through. And more importantly, we also have to work with the Federal Aviation Administration to get a certification on this whole thing so that it can be deemed safe for operation. And then you can get your approval to go fly. And yep. so this RFP it was, was, was announced to solicit input from industry to find you know, some drone operators who would be willing to partner with us to go through this process. And uh, it's, it's a shared collaboration. You know, I would say it was uh, uh, focused to uh, OEMs or aircraft manufacturers who are interested in doing this anyway, but now have kind of an objective and a mission in, in the partnership of the state of North Dakota, TALIS, the, the fact that we're part of an FAA Beyond program, all of that, you know, comes with this now. And so we'll partner with some of these companies to go through this. We won't be able to do it all in one shot. You know, it's not like we're going to select a bunch of them and we're going to start and finish on the same day, but we'll, we'll see what use cases their equipment is um, best suited for. Maybe it's package delivery, maybe it's linear infrastructure inspection. And then we'll go through the process of integrating the technology to the network, working with um, the certification folks to, uh, to, to figure out what that looks like, and then to go out and flight test and validate this whole system and these processes and these airplanes uh, against real world use cases. So, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Um, in recent years, we've seen uh, a lot of drone companies that are looking to fly their drones beyond visual line of sight. They've been doing a lot of their testing in, in other countries other than the United States. For instance, uh, Amazon took their drone to the UK. Uh, Wing uh, from Google, they took their delivery drones to Australia to start testing there. Uh, Zipline, for instance, was, was testing with their delivery drones uh, in uh, a number of African countries, saying that the rules and regulations there were were less strict and allowed them to fly drones in ways that we can't here in the US. Um, I have two questions really. One, do test sites like yours now allow these kind of companies to do similar testing here in the United States? And secondly, uh, do you guys share best practices and learnings with some of those international uh, or test sites that are located in other countries in the US? Uh, yeah, so the um, uh, I'll start with let's let's talk about kind of the differences here, and then that I think will help uh, uh, answer that question or those questions. 
um, you know, I'm very aware of, of the international community and the ability to fly BB loss in, in different countries and their rules and regulations. And it's a great opportunity for these manufacturers to get out there and get operating and get some real world experience. Um, it, you know, comparing the process you go through in other countries to the U.S. process is um, it, it's not to say any are better or worse than each other, but they're just different environments and different expectations and different risk profiles. And what do I mean by that? In the United States, you have everything from the ability to fly a 1950s, you know, Piper Cub that has no electrical system on board, no radios, no transponding beacon. And they have every right with the rules and regulations that are established today to be able to fly, you know, on a Saturday morning and not squawk or talk to anybody as long as they follow the airspace rules and, and register the airplane and are properly qualified to do that. Um, so they can do that as well as have commercial airliners that are flying, you know, up in the, the, the 30,000 foot range with hundreds of passengers on board flying from point A to point B. You have, uh, you know, you have helicopters operating that same airspace coming in and out of urban environments for, for medical, uh, you know, services in and out of hospitals, mm -hmm. um, in, you know, everything in between in, in military operations. And, and so what I mean by that is the United States has an incredibly robust and very busy airspace system. Now, if I start to look at that risk environment and I start to um, profile it against another company or I'm sorry, another country's airspace and ground space environment, you know, it, it, you can't always make an apples to apples comparison. Uh, your population densities in uh, certain countries, let's say more in the Scandinavian country area, um, the airspace density and the amount of traffic in it is also probably different. And so your your standards and your certification efforts and the, the tolerance for risk in that environment are, are just different. And, and what I mean by this is like, not that one is better than the other, because when it comes to evaluating risk, you know, if you're driving on a, a backcountry road that no other traffic is on, you know, what's my likelihood of hitting another vehicle? Well, it's really, really, really low. But if I'm on the interstate driving along at 70 miles per hour, you know, my likelihood of, of striking another vehicle can be really high if I don't have the right controls in place. I don't have a good vehicle. I don't have good training to drive on that road. And and that's what I mean by like, does that mean the interstate or the backcountry road are better than or worse than the other? No, it's just a different environment. And so the countries are in the same way, in my opinion. Just because you can get certified or approved for flight in another country does not mean it has an equal weight when it comes to the United States uh, certification process. But there are opportunities there to get flying earlier and in, in, you know, a country like Africa, which is which is or a continent like Africa, which is incredibly large and vast. Um, you know, their airspace density tolerance for risk, ground ground risk, all of that is just different than it is in the United States. So hopefully that kind of oh, like brings a little bit of insight on why it's just not so easy to take drone that was certified, you know, in a European country and bring it over to the United States. Yeah. Your other question was, is there collaboration occurring? And there absolutely is. Um, you know, there's a couple different uh, groups out there, the ICAO, uh, International Civil Aviation Organization. Um, you also have uh, JARIS, which is, uh, I forgot what it stands for, but it's an, an international community that's been collaborating, which includes the United States on, on coming up with, um, you know, best practices and procedures on how can we take all the lessons learned and the collective wisdom in the world and bring it down to a level that each country can adopt? So there are efforts going on there. There is a lot of active collaboration and communication. Um, it's still gonna take a long time to continue to work through and, and understand how this will all integrate. Um, but you know, there'll be a time period there where I, I think we're still gonna see a lot of differences, but in, in time, in the long run, I think we'll start to see something similar to what we have here in, in the manned aviation world where I may have an airworthiness certification issued in, in Europe, you know, like Airbus, and that that becomes accepted in the United States. And that's just because it's a really well understood process that the FAA is able to accept and, and vice versa for the European countries. This this conversation has just been amazing. Uh, Haya and I have actually been going back and forth, and and we we have unfortunately to remove questions because we're getting close to the end of the of of your time of your valuable time sharing with us. Um, I, I want to talk about the ARC report because this is something that's kind of uh, a hot topic at the moment. For those of you listening, the ARC is the Aviation Ruling Committee. Uh, they just released a report with recommendations about flying beyond visual line of sight, and. 
um, as there, there was a, a rule in there, you're a flying instructor, you're a commercial pilot, and so am I. And, and I'm reading this report, and I'm sure you have as well, where they're talking about amending the right of way rules, uh, especially for manned aircraft that are flying below 500 feet that are not equipped with ADSB uh, out. And uh, you mentioned these people that are flying in the airspace without any kind of equipment. How do you feel about this rule as a manned aircraft pilot and as a UAS pilot and being involved with all of this? How do you think this is going to go with the industry? And um, Great question, and, uh, and, and I've, I've done more than read the report. I actually inherited leadership responsibility on the ARC. Um, my predecessor, Nick Flom, was a, a lead on the 2.1 working group, and then when he uh, moved on, uh, I got to inherit that responsibility, and then uh, I've got somebody else on my team here, Aaron Raisler, who has been heavily involved in RTCA and ASTM standards community, communities, and, and so between her and I, and, and really you know, props to Erin on my team because she helped take the, the 2.1 effort to the finish line for the ARC. Um, and so both of our names are, are on that final report and have, um, you know, let's say knowledge and, and background on how these conversations uh, came about. I will, what I'll tell you is, is I'll say purely my opinion because the right away uh, suggestions came from another working group and I, I do not want to uh, say that I'm representing their their viewpoints on this. and and. But so what I'll tell you is just, you know, kind of purely my opinion based on the dialogue on that is, um, you know, my interpretation of it is that, yes, you know, there there is a, a, a suggestion of amending right away, um, especially when you start to get into, um, uh, you know, kind of that, that shrouded infrastructure. And, and really the concept behind this is, you know, can I operate a drone, you know, within 100 feet or something of, of infrastructure like a tower or a building? And I think as a drone operator, and, and I've, I've done that as well, you can kind of confidently say like, yes, I can. I, I, where I'm located and watching my drone against the building or against the tower, it's very easy to discern you know, my distance against um, that, that physical object and, and be able to maintain a, a, an offset from that. Um, now in the cockpit, you know, I, I will say this again, my opinion as the average pilot flying in the airspace system, are you able to differentiate you know, that low to the ground, you know, what's the difference between 500 feet, 600 feet, 700 feet, 800 feet? You, I'll, I'll be honest, for me, it becomes like really uncomfortable unless I'm by a runway, right? You know, like mm -hmm. that, that, that's like, uh, yeah. I yeah. feel a little nervous about that, in fact. And so that's really where this concept starts to grow from, again, in my opinion, that most uh, pilots that are going to be operating your average user are never going to be operating that close to infrastructure, because that's, that's pretty close when it comes to a manned airplane and to operating any closer than that starts to, um, you know, let's put it this way. It'd be like a, an aerial applicator. They're used to operating close to the ground. They're used to understanding what it means to be very close to power lines and, and towers and other infrastructure that's tied very close to the ground. But that ends up being a specialized skill. That ends up being something that a pilot trains for and, and gains experience on. And so when, when that pilot is interacting in the same environment as the drone operator, there can be a shared responsibility to see and avoid because both of those aviators have the, the qualifications and the experience to understand how to remain well clear of each other and, and stay safely separated from each other because they're both used to operating that close to whether it be the ground or, or the infrastructure. But I would argue that your average pilot is probably not used to doing that. So to amend the right of way rules for that domain is actually not going to have that big of an impact on, uh, on your average user. And you know, regardless with how part 91 is written today, there is always a shared responsibility for everybody operating under part 91 to, to remain well clear of all of the traffic in the airspace system. Um, and there is, of course, an acknowledged uh, extra burden on the drone operators today. And I think that has to remain true. Um, you know, what, what, I, what I'm saying is that when, when a professional drone operator is operating next to this infrastructure this close to the ground, I treat them and, and, and consider them to be just as professional as any other aviator in, in the sky, and that they also have to do their due diligence to, to maintain uh, right away against all other users in the airspace system. So I don't know if that helps. That's, again, I, I say that from um, my opinion based on my best understanding. But again, my, my disclaimer is I was not that working group and I, I don't represent the opinions or views of that working group. 
Well, Trevor, I, I I know I know we have a time limit today, but um, I know we're going to be doing a part two about this because there's so many more questions that we have. We haven't even talked about the FA relationship. We haven't talked about remote ID. Uh, I want to talk more about the ARC report as well. There's a lot more questions that we removed from the interview. So uh, we'll be back. And uh, I, I really wanted to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, I know if people are interested, they can find more information about the testing sites online on the FA website, You on the uh, well, on the FA website and also on your website, uh, I know there's a ton of great information there. I spend uh, I spend a few hours looking at the website, uh, preparing for the interview. Um, for those of you that are watching, uh, the Pixel Drone Show goes live every Tuesday morning. Uh, please like, subscribe, leave your comments. We love interacting with you in the comments on YouTube. And uh, as always, we'll see you next week.